Sometimes, seemingly small extrapolations from precedent have also led to disaster. The builders of the great medieval cathedrals kept building structures with higher and higher vaults, as we can see by this sketch drawn by A.W. Skempton in the 1950s. Reims, 12% higher than Chartres. Amiens, 13% higher than Reims. But when Beauvais was attempted, only 10% higher than Amiens, it proved to be too far beyond precedent and collapsed disastrously. It was finally rebuilt to a much lower height. Here again, the designers of that time followed precedent, extrapolated a bit, but they couldn't tell how far they dared extrapolate, and sometimes they overshot. So the empirical basis for judgment is important, but carries us only so far. There's another basis. It's the theoretical basis. And theory also has its limitations, but it gives us a feel for things. I learned this, I suppose, when I was in Chicago, working on the subway project there. Carl Terzaghi was writing his book on theoretical soil mechanics. One of my best friends in Chicago, Al Cummings, was district manager for the Raymond Concrete Pile Company, a very unusual man. By day, he was an extremely persuasive pile salesman. He could sell piles under almost any circumstances. By night, he entertained himself by delving into theory, particularly theory of elasticity and theories applied to soil mechanics. And he not only studied the theories and knew them, but he corresponded vigorously with the people who were working in the theories at that time. So Tritsagi, knowing this, asked Al to review the manuscript of theoretical soil mechanics. And since Al and I saw each other a lot, Al began to pass the manuscript to me, and I read it also, and soon Tritsagi found out about this, and we both became his guinea pigs. Now, I was never given any reputation as a theoretician, and indeed I am not a theoretician. But going through these theories, examining which ones were really applicable, under what circumstances they were not applicable, and seeing the relationships, the theoretical relationships among the variables that entered a problem, turned out to be an important part of my background. It's not something I use. I don't make calculations on a theoretical basis very often. But those relations are there. They're in the background. And they help guide judgment in areas where precedent is not a wise thing to use. I suppose the question then comes, how do we cultivate engineering judgment, or can it be cultivated? Some people are inclined to think you are born with it and you have it, or you're not born with it and you don't. I think it can be cultivated, and I think it even can be taught. One way to cultivate it is to make a conscious effort to determine the size of things, to see how various structures have been built and what their dimensions are, to know how deep is feasible to excavate a foundation and so forth. This means to keep up with the literature. To have a good education and follow it by reading the literature is a very good step toward developing judgment. A second thing that a young person can do to cultivate judgment is to plan his career, to select jobs of different kinds in the first few years of that career. If you are a structural engineer, for example, it would be a good idea to have some experience in design. It would be a good idea to have some experience in the fabrication of structures. It would be a very good idea to have some experience in construction, so you would find out whether you could put the things together that had been designed. Now, most employers do not make it their highest priority to see that a young person gets a varied experience. Many employers only do one thing, for example. They only design. They can't put an employee on construction. 
And so if you are a person looking for a breadth of experience, I think you have to do it yourself. You have to owe it to yourself to decide which kinds of experience you would like to get, to change jobs occasionally until you get that breadth of experience. This involves a certain amount of sacrifice sometimes. It means losing um, seniority in some firms. It means moving your family around. It means putting the kids in different schools and the like. But it is still a very important thing to get that variety of experience, which is an invaluable asset in building judgment. A very good way to cultivate judgment is to keep a notebook. Tritsagi insisted on this when I first went to work on the Chicago subway. He insisted that I write down everything I had done that day, everything I had seen on the job, every conversation I had that was of some technical interest. I was in and out of the tunnel headings very often, several headings a day quite often. And I would come back to the lab and sit down to write in my notebook. I would try to make a sketch of what I had seen in the heading, the bracing, how it went together, where the excavation was with respect to the bracing and the like. And I would discover all too often that when I came back, I couldn't do it. I had missed some particular detail. I didn't really know how things went together. And I'd have to go back to the heading and look. After I'd done that two or three times, I began to learn how to look in the first place and remember, and then come back and be able to make satisfactory sketches. The power of observation is greatly improved by this very simple operation of keeping a notebook. It's something that one might do all his life, but certainly should be doing as a young person until the ability is achieved to register what is seen with your eyes. Judgment, I think, can be taught in the classroom in many ways. The instructor, if he has experience, can certainly bring his experiences to his class, and this is extremely valuable. It helps a student get an idea of the size of things and of what is important in the profession. The professor can also teach his students to make back-of-the-envelope calculations for more complex problems. Not all instructors feel this way, I am afraid, I think unfortunately. One of my colleagues at the University of Illinois has said for many years, if you can't make a back-of-the-envelope calculation to get a rough idea of what the situation is, what the important variables are, you have no business even trying to do a finite element calculation. That back-of-the-envelope calculation, again, gives one an idea of the size of things, what the answer ought to be. And if somebody hasn't had that experience and sets something up with an elaborate computer program and gets many numbers to look at, he has nothing to compare those numbers with. He has no way of comparing this with reality. He has no way of looking at it in a simple manner to see if it makes sense at all. And so the ability to make those back-of-the-envelope calculations represents something that I believe every instructor should feel obliged to teach.